for being here with us. You never leave. You never stop being who you are. You are faithful when we are not. And you are sovereign, Lord. We trust your plan. We trust your will. And we pray as you did in the garden, Jesus, not our will, but your will be done, Father. Amen. Um, so I jotted some things down. Um, I did not have a ton of time to prepare before this evening. I started a new job two and a half weeks ago, and it's kind of whooping my butt. Um, and um, I love it. I don't not like it. I love it. Um, I love what I'm doing. It's finished carpentry stuff. Um, and I'm learning a lot because... It's a long day. It takes a lot out of me. And what's been really neat along the way, and I've had lots of hard jobs, physical, physically hard jobs. This has been the most like demanding mentally and physically that I've ever actually been in. Like it's been a recipe of both. And what was really special about it is that I keep finding myself at the end, end of the day at the end of me. And when I'm at the end of myself, there he is. As John the Baptist said, he says, I must decrease so that he can increase. Amen. And I feel very decreased <laughs> at the end of my day. Um, so much so that it's taught me in that way. And we can all live in that place from start to finish on our day. It doesn't have to be at the end. But that just the past two and a half weeks. And, and again, I've worked some really hard jobs. My wife and I, we've got five kids. For those of you that know us, those of you that don't, you just found out how busy we are. Um, and, um, and so we're doing a lot. We, you know, we, we, have, we have our family, we have our jobs, we have ministry, all of it's ministry. Um, but it's a lot. It's a lot on a daily basis, and it's humbling. And I know, without the shadow of a doubt, that the only reason I am where I am, and Elizabeth is where she is, and our five kids are up to this point, and we do what we do, is by the Spirit of God, by the strength of God in us and through us. And so we don't have an excuse to be stressed. We really don't. When we're, when we're tapping into the ideas and the nature of the flesh by accepting certain things as a norm or reality, we actually invite that thing into our, we invite that reality in. Um, Romans is clear. It says that the mindset on the flesh only brings death, uh, but the mind on the spirit has life and peace. So if I have life and peace, from start to finish in my day. I can imagine I stayed in the spirit pretty well, right? Doesn't mean I'm greater than anybody else, but it means I remained in this place where I was supposed to be and I didn't move in the flesh. I didn't snap at anybody. I didn't get angry or overly angry, I should say. It's okay to be angry, just don't sin in it. But I didn't let anything overwhelm me or lead me other than the Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying that's what happened today. I think Today was one among the best days I've had in, in a while, to be honest. Um, but I was on the, on the road to, uh, to work this morning, and I'm, I'm kind of scooting along, and I'm moving in traffic, and there's this guy behind me, and he's kind of moving with me, but then I can also tell I'm really getting in his way, and he is, like, super angry at this point. Like, I wouldn't say just angry, like, wrath. It was, it was getting there. So I pull up to the stop stoplight and um, roll down the window and I kind of look at him. And I said, are you okay? And he was clearly not okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I've ever been spoken to that way <laughs> in, in my entire life. Um, I got the, the, uh, the vitriol from, from some demon and some man um, all at the same time. So it was not just infused with the anger of, the wrath of man, there was something extra going on, for sure. You could kind of feel it. Um, and so I just, 
slowed down. I kind of got in my lane. I said, you know what? I said, I'm not really going to let anybody else kind of usher me down the road. I'm just going to drive at the proper pace and not have anything else kind of pressing me other than God leading me um, to work and into a good day. Now, could I have like went back and forth with him at the light with my window down? Absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of bad things that could have happened had I chosen to move in the flesh. You know, he could have been a, a crazy guy that decided to pull a firearm on me. He could have been the type of person that rams the car into my car. I, Elizabeth and I, we saw that a month ago. We actually had to follow this person and call the cops for the other person driving because his phone was dead. It was so bad. But who knows? Something bad could have really happened to me had I chosen to respond in the flesh rather than check on him because I was actually concerned at first. I'm like, are you okay? Are you storming around? Because he was moving around frantically. I had a genuine concern for him, wondering if, like, are you, do you need the hospital? Like, do you need me to call somebody? Are you okay? And that clearly found out that he was not okay, but he had, was not in an emergency in terms of, like, his physical health. But I would say that he was in danger in his soul. Um, and that's kind of where a lot of our Wednesday nights have been, where if you just joined LifePoint or if you, this is like your first night or you've been here a few times, you can kind of see over the course of at least the two and a half, three years, my wife and I have been here serving and fully plugged in and fully invested how God has been very concerned with our hearts and our souls, more so than anything else. And to not make light of this, I would say that far beyond anything else we experience in life with God, outwardly, inwardly, whatever, He is very concerned with who we are in our inner man very concerned it very much matters what we say what we do what we watch what we listen to all of it i i don't know why this got dropped on me today driving but more driving home but more than anything he i just heard him say it matters to me it matters to me all of it matters to me you matter to me I care. I'm concerned. And often we hear a concerning message or even like a very seemingly judgmental one and we, we immediately assume that it's not God or he's, that's not very nice. That, that, that's not my Jesus. Well, you need to get a new Jesus because that's not him. And Jesus is not nice. I've, so, I've told people that for a, lo a long time. Jesus is not nice, he's kind. Niceness is based upon a lie or some darkness. It's telling somebody what they want to hear versus what they need to hear, right? I'm not saying run around and carve people up, you know. That's, those, kind of, those days are over. And I've been, fortunately, um, thank God, I've been tempered um, in a big way. And I used to be very violent with the sword, um, but, um, you know, I, as I was sitting, Lord, what are you, what, what, what am I doing tonight? Do I need to call somebody else? I don't feel extra equipped tonight, um, for this. And, and so I immediately started asking questions. I'm like, do I call somebody else? Do I, you know, pass it on to someone else? Is there someone else you want to, to share tonight? Um, and he didn't say anything to me, which was kind of odd. He didn't answer my question. I just kind of sat. And as I was sitting, I just said, you know what? I said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. <laughs> and he, he was like, I was waiting for that. And I think that's where a lot of us are in our lives and, and daily in daily situations and circumstances is we're finding ourselves in these situations where we still aren't really fully aware that we're still doing things according to our own will a lot of the time. It is not the Father. It's not our God who is 
leading us and it is we are in his will in any moment. And I'm not saying that to cause anyone to panic. What I am saying is it is this simple. Father, not my will, but your will be done. Forgive me for leading my own life, for living by my own desires if they're not yours. Whatever's going on inside of me, I need you to reveal it to me and check me on it. Just check me on it. And he will. Now, he's not going to show up with like, he might, he might, excuse me. He's not going to show up some clipboard like, well, we got this problem and this problem and this problem, and uh, these are my prescriptions for it. M- maybe, you know, maybe that's a way God shows up and deals with you. Um, I would say after you pray that prayer out of a place of humility and honesty that you just need to be aware, like, Lord, okay, I'm here. You're about to walk in it. He's going to do what you've just asked him to do because it is about him developing us, you, me, his family, into forming Jesus inside of us. That's what God paid for was to form Jesus within us, the Father's forming us into the image of his Son, which is why we're not all perfect every day. Had we became perfect as soon as we were born again, there would have been no need for God to send the Holy Spirit, and there would be no need to do anything in God's name because we'd all be walking around on water. And so this inner healing thing has brought me into a lot of other things along with being healed of my own stuff. But I just, I think what I got a little fed up with, and I think this was some holy anger, not uh, the wrath of man, um, was that I just, I don't think it needs to be complicated anymore. We've got to let it be simple. Like just making, like doing the song and the dance, and I'm guilty of this, right? I'm sorry for anybody who's like, I have either laid a stumbling block before you or I've made the thing, the getting into the kingdom or getting what God wants for you difficult over time. I'm sorry if I have done that to any of you. I don't know if I have uh, how many or how, you know, have, but just to cover myself in this way and cover us and, and my, you as my family members, I'm sorry for making things difficult at any point and if I've done that. Because Jesus was, he just wasn't, the path is difficult, but he really isn't in the sense that he explains it and then reveals it. And it's really that easy. All we have to do is humble ourselves and obey him. And what is that? What is that? What does it mean to humble ourselves and obey? What, there's another word. It's just one word. Anybody? Love. Right? Love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It all boils down to that. I, I'm a Galatians 5, 6 guy. We're going to go there because I always do. Vince will tell you, right, Vince? that at some point I'm going to pull Galatians out. And we're going to have this scripture up, right? Thank you. So I'm actually going to read um, actually all the way through um, from 5.1 five, five, to 5.6. Five, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not, do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will not profit you anything. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the, the whole or entire law. You have become estranged from Christ you who attempt to be justified by the law or your own works, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope 
of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision credits, gives us anything, credits us anything, avails us anything, but faith works through love. And so I have this conversation often with my, with my kids. I tell them, I'm like, there's two ways you can obey me. As, if, as your dad, you can obey me because you're avoiding the Mr. Pow Pow, or you can obey me because you love me and you want to honor me as your dad and your mom the same way. Either way, the house will have order and you will receive from me and relate to me or, ha- or have a, a, a a moment with me on either side of this thing because I'm not going to have chaos in my house. I've got five children, so if one of them goes nuts, the rest of them will go nuts eventually. It, ble- it, it does. It just spreads into the... And it, so does order, too, because one, once you have to correct one, however you correct them, it, everyone else is like, you tell them to do something, they're like, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't, I don't think I want to... I want Mr. Pow Pow, you know, not feeling it. Um, or when one child does things like Noah, um, I had to brag on him for a minute. Um, he just, um, he, one, we were watching a movie together. We got that new Jurassic uh, World Dominion movie. They love dinosaurs. We're careful what we let them watch, but we let them watch scary dinosaur stuff because we just like dinosaurs. And uh, Noah gets up just on his own, goes and makes me an ice water and comes and puts it on the bed next, puts it on the, on the nightstand next to me and says, Dad, move over. He goes, I want to lay down with you. Can we, can we snuggle and finish watching the movie? And um, so he serves me. Um, and it was interesting. After he did that, and I didn't say anything. I didn't, like, get up and go, look at what Noah has done. You know, I, I didn't go do any of that. But I was, you know, it did definitely touch my heart, and I was like, okay, this is really good. The other kids started doing those things for their brothers, you know, their brothers or their sister or me or their, mother, their mom. And it wasn't like they were looking for some grand, grandiose recognition. And sometimes that's a reason to withhold praise to see if others will just do it for the, because it's the right thing to do or it's, out of, it's pure. Um, patting people on the back for every good thing they do, it can really turn out to be a spoiler. Um, so, yes, I, I think that in order for us to really receive these deeper things that all, many of us are wanting from God, including healing in our heart and our soul, we've got to remember that we're going to God in love. That faith works through love. And that's how the deeper work gets done. It's not out of the rigmarole of, did I, did I say this right? Did I do this right? How about this? How about that? I just, for some reason, the, God knows, um, the recent lessons have been how powerless I am on my own in my own flesh and in my own soul. I only have so much and it is so little in comparison to what should be coursing through me as a believer. Because Romans 8 is pretty clear. Very clear about it. So let's go there. I, I use a, a combination of like the New King James. Sometimes I have like the English Standard memorized and then the American Standard and then maybe another one. Um, and so sometimes I'll mix some of the words. They all mean the same, but I'll use a different word. Like for avail, like in that last one, sometimes it says credits versus avails. I know the Greek, if I wanted to, felt like then we needed to dive into the Greek uh, words, the Septuagint, uh, we could do that, but it would pretty much just be a flesh fest at that point, just to puff our little intellect. Um, 
we're not establishing doctrine at this point. I'm just preaching it. But um, Romans 8 says, which I love, 11, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That means that every believer is supposed to have life, energy, future, in their body by the Spirit of God. He's there to strengthen our mortal bodies to do what we need to do on a daily basis. Can somebody say amen? amen. Because I need the strength. I need that life. And here's the thing. All I have to do is believe that written word. We've ta- I, we've, we talked about this in our men's group on Thursday nights. Um, that... There's two words used in the New Testament for word, the word of God. Uh, one is the logos and the rhema. And what's interesting is that this is the logos on paper. It's everything that God has said or revealed to us at this point in terms of what we have as a written document. Has God said more than what's in this book? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, we can't say God has said this and it contradict what's written here, because that would be a no-no, right? If anything, it, he's revealing more of it to us on a daily basis, which is why when you read the scriptures, you might read it one day and it hits you one, one certain way. You might read it the next, the same scripture, or a month or two or three months or a year later, and it hits you differently based upon what God is revealing to you in the moment, because Jesus dealt with this mindset, and I'm going after the mind here because we need this, and the heart, is that he looked at the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he was like, you search the Scriptures so that in them you will find eternal life. He said, they testify of me. So read, just reading the Scripture and having no real communion with God doesn't do anything but kill you or confuse you. If, if the Lord's not present with you in it, or oh, you're not really aware that God is your teacher, you're, you're killing yourself. The letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. 1 Corinthians. But believe that. Believe it. Don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. It says it right here in plain English, and I can br- we could bring up ten different versions, and I maybe one day I'll do that. Probably not, but maybe because I just it's overkill. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Through His Spirit who dwells in you. Has the Spirit of God stopped dwelling in you? No. No. Take that one to the bank. Hide it in your heart. Hide it in your heart. Lord, I hid Your Word in my heart so that I would not sin against You. This will help you not sin against him, I can assure you that much. When you're walking around with life, when you want to be, or you could be worn out and impatient and unkind unkind and slide over into the flesh and become, what I like to say, a verbal Edward Scissorhands. Start cutting people up. It's real. It's real. Um, so, I was sitting in the in the kids uh, the nursery. Um, my wife and I we do we serve as the nursery and children's ministry directors, and I love sitting in that little nursery in there because there's a little rocking chair that reminds me of the porch at my granddaddy's house. Um, 
And I was sitting in there, and I'm like, okay. My question um, to him was, uh, are you planning on sharing anything with me that you would like to talk about tonight? That literally was my question as I was sitting in there just wondering. And he was like, just relax. He goes, I got this. And I was like, well, okay. Um, and then I had wondered, I'm like, Lord, I know that I, know that I have not sought you like I, I should or I could. Let me say that better. I haven't sought you like I could. Why is that? Um, and he, it's funny because there was a little, I peek out of the corner of my eye after I opened my eyes, after I asked the question, and it literally says on the board, I gave slop. So he, he was like, you give me your leftovers. And he goes, I'm not receiving those anymore. Have mercy, because, you know, married, five kids, judge me not. What I appreciate about, one of the things I appreciate about God is that um, we, anyone that stands in here, or any of us as believers, we stand by his election, we had, we had decisions to make, but he chose us before we chose him, no matter where we're at or how we're doing, how good we are at it or how terrible we are, how many mistakes we make, whatever it is, he chose us. Did we have to respond and, and in faith choose him back? Absolutely. But Jesus said nobody comes to the Father unless the Spirit first draws him in. So he had a lot to do with us coming to him. A lot to do. He doesn't violate our will, but he is sovereign. And so, so many things were done and moved and influenced and calculated and all that stuff. I say calculated like he needed to calculate. He knew all, all of it, so we won't pretend like he was without knowledge. But all, the, all these different things he did without violating our will to get us into a place where we could know him and receive from him in whatever capacity. Um, but, you know, uh, Abby uh, brought these up to me today. Um, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, Abby, but you've got to deal with it now because you gave me the rocks. I won't throw them at you. Um, but they're rainbows or rainbow rocks. Pretty cool looking, right? Well, I guess somebody from um, Tallahassee Rocks came and, you know, painted on the back that we need to say gay and drop rocks off on the property for the kids to find. So, you know, here's what I, here's how I handle that. And I think that God's with me. I know that God's with me, is this is a conversation piece. I mean, what do I tell my kids? Like, don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't ask me about that. We're not talking about that right now. Why? Am I scared of it? Worried? It's, it's out there. It's being thrown in their face. It's being rolled into, into the dirt at church. A church. No, use it as a conversation piece. Share, share with your children what God says. And, some, and do it simply. As a, and, and for the mothers and fathers and, and, and parents of little ones, model a, a godly marriage. Maybe your children will want that. Maybe that's where it should start. Boom. Um, but I, I've gotten to this conversation, and I'd like to bring it up because I think it's super important. Nope. Oh, that's about all I got. Um, 
because when you look at that scripture, and I'm going here for a reason tonight, uh, God knows why, but I'm, I believe I kind of have an idea. He's shown me at least. 1 Corinthians 6, where it talks about not suing the brethren and a lot of the, the sins um, uh, against your own body and sexual sins that are not good. And uh, very, we should definitely flee from them, those youthful lusts. But um, I'm going to start in verse 7. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brothers or your family. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Now, I, I remember the, 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 the ones on the, on the corner holding the signs with that scripture. And straight, just face smacking as people are driving by. They got the scripture out, and they think this is going to turn the heart of a, uh, of a person. Who was that written to? <laughs> the church of Corinth. It wasn't written to lost humanity. I mean, does it apply to them? Absolutely. That, that, this letter was written to the people of God to understand that these were not acceptable ways to live. What is our job as believers to do before we talk to anybody about any of that stuff that's not saved? What's that? We, that's a good one, repent. But preach the gospel to them. Live it. They need to be loved and introduced to a father who will deal with their heart. Not condemned and beat with Expo by exposing their sin for them. It doesn't mean like if you get into a conversation, you deny what's written. But it's amazing to me that we don't understand how to use the word in due season, in the right place, in the right context, for us as much as for other people. That's kind of where we're at tonight. That's how we get inner healing healing of our souls is to stop stop making this thing difficult and accept that the lord's dealing with me inwardly i keep thinking that things are going to happen outwardly all the time he wants my inner man first he wants my heart and then the other things can start to happen and i find myself in this situation or in these moments and situations with him with him and other people that are testing my heart and drawing these things out so that they can be dealt with so I can repent of them and have them removed and sometimes the conflict that we might have with another person is not only to des designed to deliver us both and for us to both get healing it's to strengthen their relationship with that individual who would have thought? Maybe the conflict was necessary because all you've been doing is sticking your head in the sand and running from it. Amen. Amen. Out of the mouth of babes. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Proverbs 4 says that we're to guard our hearts, our hearts above all else, for out of them springs the issues of life. And I think that without like combing through the entire Gospels, how often did Jesus talk about the heart? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his, of his heart brings forth good things. Bad man, bad things. It's not what goes in a man's mouth that defiles him. It's what comes out of his mouth and out of his heart that defiles him. Proverbs, 
Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Those that love it will eat its fruit. I mean, the list goes on. So some of the healing that we want, desire, need is tied to us having our minds renewed and changing our confession. And by doing so, it's important that our entire heart is laid bare and given over to God. Otherwise, it's like, you you know the scripture where it says, um, this law is at war among your members. There's a law that's at war between the mind and the heart constantly if we're not careful it just goes back and forth and it's just back and forth between heart mind well I feel this in my heart and I've got this strong conviction but my mind I still got this stuff and it's unrenewed and they're both connected and I just don't (sighs) and man do we need the peace we need the peace that's promised in Philippians so let's go there This will help you stop watching the news, too. (laughs) (laughs) Woo! All right. So, Philippians 4. Let's go ahead and start at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious... For nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So we probably need to do that in order for the peace of God to guard our hearts and minds, which we just mentioned, there's a war between. There's a reason God differentiates between the two right there in that text. I believe Paul being led by God, man, I just, I love a lot of, uh, the epistles are fantastic. I'm glad that God knocked him off the horse. You know, and as you think about that, you know, what if sometimes we're panicking while God's knocking people off their horse? And he's about to do something big in their life. Just kind of goes, just blew through my spirit as I uh, just kind of think about that. God knocks somebody off, the, off their horse, and sometimes we'd be like, oh, look, he got the judgment of God all over him. Actually, that was part of God bringing him in, saving him. Bl- he blinded him, saved him, baptized him. Fills him with the Holy Spirit and he writes 80% of the New Testament. How many people are about to get knocked off their horses and brought into the kingdom? We're wanting God's judgment to fall sometimes and we don't want to see the other piece to it. I want more, I want more Saul's to get knocked over their head and pushed off their horse. Blinded. However it happened, God did it, Right? We can accept that. We don't know if like a hand or an angel said, poop. (laughs) It says a light shone, blinded them, and then something happened. We don't exactly know how it happened, but we know it happened. I'll let your imagination go with it there. Just don't twist the scriptures. Verse 8, finally, I'm going to change brethren to family. Finally, family, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Turn off the news. And whatever else is not worthy of meditating upon. Whatever it is, 
It could be that magazine or that the Facebook or Instagram or the social media stuff. I, I mean, I spend too much time on that stuff sometimes, and all it does is just eat up time that you could have spent just sitting and meditating on the things of God and and then almost like sitting. I Pastor David said it right. I read when I read scripture. I, I, there's like a fire that starts in my bones, like just like Jeremiah. I can read it and my, my physically get hot. My temperature goes up. I can feel the life and fire of God on me as I'm reading the Bible. That's not me. The Kyle's not special. That's just something that happens with me. I, I know other people that it, that it happens to. What I'm saying is like that is... Is that possible? Absolutely. What if all you did was think about those things? Noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. Meditate on them. Not how much money's in the bank account, because sometimes that's not praiseworthy. It's not. It's not. you got to find yourself going, you know what? Regardless, Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's start saying that stuff and believing it. I'm not saying word of faith here. This is not a, some doctrine I'm saying you could just name it and claim it. But at some point, we've got, if the Lord is our shepherd, we shall have no lack. He meant it. Right. Yeah. Right. It's pretty plain, Right? Too many people are excusing good things from God because it was twisted by a man or woman in a pulpit somewhere. How many of God's promises are we going to miss out because man screwed them up? Come on. Do I need to say that again? How many of God's promises are we going to miss out because men and women screwed them up or tried to screw them up? That's a real thing. God deals with it. I'm glad he hasn't struck me down. Where else are we going, Lord? Let's go to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians Uno. All righty. Verse twelve. Now I say this that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest any of you should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. I want to get into the separatism idea because we kind of touched on that for a second concerning doctrinal stuff. You know, you got your word of faith, you got your hyper grace, you got all these denominations, right, in the land. All of it, all of it. None of it's from God. None of that system and models are from God. Some of the some of the stuff in it is absolutely God's mixed into it for sure. He loves people. He loves people. But to to say you know like this is Life Point Church, great. Life we don't walk around with a bunch of T-shirts on talking about we're Life Point Church. Join our church. We got it going on here. We're the real spiritual ones. You know. 
that's not Richard. That's not Darlene. That's not their culture. That's not where they're from. They did family and the kingdom of God in Mexico. And that's what God, that's who, that's who we are to him. We're his, we're God's family. We're the body on the earth. So don't separate yourself either in your mind or your heart. Don't separate yourself from your brothers and sisters outside these four walls or walking the earth anywhere. They're just as much our brothers and sisters at any other church. Now, I will say this. Church systems and doctrinal stuff and a lot of that stuff, some of it can be demonic and some of it can be very program driven and box God right out and expect Jesus to sit on the back row. He's either in charge or he's not. And I can assure you, he's the only one that should be in charge. He's the only one that hasn't been corrupted by power. Which is a reason why all of us need more of him. And we need to die daily and take up our cross. It stinks. Some of us are, are still kicking and screaming. And you need to know that your father, our father, is not, he's not uh, keeping score like you're failing him. He's just saying, come to me, you who are weary and heavy burdened, and in me you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Matthew 11. Whew. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I think it's time for us to learn from him. Yes, there are apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And in this church, we believe in the entire fivefold ministry. One of them is actually constantly jogging back and forth between pastor and teacher and teacher and pastor. That tends to be pretty consistent. Most, pa most pastors are teaching in pulpits right now. I'm teaching right now. I'm also preaching and pastoring the children. But apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are here for what reason? Anybody? What was that? Edify the body? That's part of it. What's the other part? Ephesians 4, if you would. There it is. There's that. What's that? Yeah, equipping of the saints. There's, a, there's, a, there's one that, is, um, that we're missing, though. All right, verse 11. 1-1. One, one. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith. That means in any space, in any place, if we are rejecting these gifts that God has given to the body, we are rejecting a portion of Jesus. Meaning that how can you go anywhere and get more things from God if they have boxed out certain gifts and certain measures of Him where you are? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. That means that like, if you're not in a place that is welcoming of all that God has and all that He is and all that He provides, how do you think you're going to become unified with your other brothers and sisters? Again, that's not a life point church thing. That's a written in Ephesians 4 thing. 
And it's about time we get back to the authority of what's written too. I'm going to be real frank and honest about that. It is written. That's how Satan dealt with, I mean, that's how Jesus dealt with Satan. Right? Think about it. He comes to him in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and says, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And it says, and Jesus was hungry. I bet I'd be hungry too after 40 days. It doesn't indicate that he had water either. That one's odd. Because I fasted for a while with water, and I needed that water. Or at least I thought I did. Y'all can convict me later. And Jesus says, as it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. As it is written, family. We need to start knowing what is written. And at the same time, as we know what's written, it does what for us? Come on, somebody heard it earlier. Oh, when we read the scriptures, they testify to us about him. They're testifying to us. That's literally what they're doing. In the spirit, they're jumping out and saying, Jesus did this. He said this. I'm saying this to you. That's how you can read a Bible, a scripture out of this, and it jumps off the page or it comes to life. Or you go through something and then you read a scripture that describes exactly what you went through. Or you read it and then you go through it. Right? Come on. I know God's preaching right now because I don't preach this good. I prophesy all right, but I don't preach this good. I know it's the Lord because he's breaking me. So we need to be fighting for this. People are, people are writing books and preaching on unity and all this stuff, but can't accept an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, and a pastor and teacher in their church. Well, guess how much unity you're going to have? Or very, very little. Fine, do it. You, you're doing it against the, the word, word of God, what's already written. Church government is very clear inside the New Testament if you look at it. And it's not something that, it's, uh, there's so many bad examples. Oh, I hate it. There still are. There's tons of bad examples, guys. Not here. I'm grateful for it. I praise God and His infinite goodness that we do not have that issue here in our government of this place because it is legitimately with Richard, and he's not here right now. When's he come back in town? Tomorrow night. He fights for that government inside this place. It's not he's fighting for it inside Life Point Church, even though it's we we march under that banner to a degree. It's because he understands what this what this place is, who we are as a family, how it should be governed. Lived in, preached, and planted churches in Mexico for 17 years. Is that right? An apostle planted churches, went and brought the kingdom somewhere it wasn't, and it was established and grew. What is that? we got another word for it that we want to feel better about in other denominations, another missionary. No, an apostle. He showed up and planted the kingdom of God and took territory from the enemy, and the Lord grew it. How else? What were the apostles doing in, in all throughout the New Testament? So clear, something so simple has been so perverted and so labeled differently. It's like the same thing. Have you guys heard of those denominations that will say, we're going to go and do prophetic evangelism today? Well, why not just evangelism? With the gifts of God operating. We got to add an extra name to it so we can feel better. Oh, we're we're really doing it 
We really got it. We're the, we're the real ones. We, we do prophetic evangelism. You just do regular. So silly and so dumb. Please, that's how we make it difficult and not keep it simple. And I, I heard the Lord say this months ago. I said it in leadership, the, one of our leadership meetings, and I, I think it, it rings true right now. He said, I'm about to make everything that you've made difficult simple. And that's what I continue to see happen. Since that, that time, or at least that what was going on in the Spirit, I've seen things become easier, and God reveal more of himself, or not reveal more of himself, but as he's revealing himself, people are starting to think in a very simple spiritual way where they can grab a hold of what's being said and what's being done by God in the Spirit. And y'all can fact check me on this. Does anybody know what the three people groups were in Israel at the time when Jesus shows up? Three major people groups. Um, close. All right, so there was the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and another group of what was known as the Essenes. And they were kind of like the blue-collar, uh, simple-minded, hard-working folk. And who happened to be the largest group of people that received Jesus? Oh, man. So you want to be like the smart ones that know everything? Or the ones that have their ways? We, the, the fathers have told us to do it this way. This is all we've, this is, we've always done it this way. Well, I'm looking forward to God undoing that. And I think we need to be accepting of that. We've always done it this way. What if Jesus shows up and says, or tells you, says shows up like he's not already here? Um, he just tells you, he's like, uh, yeah, doing it wrong. This is the way. Me. I'm the way. The truth and the life. You're not going to get the Father this way. This, the Father's not going to bless this. Because it's not me. If you abide in me and I in you, you will be in the Father and the Father will be in you. John 14, 15, 16, 17. The whole book of John is filled with being one with God. Man, giving us something to think about, Lord. Meditate on. I saw that scripture and I was looking for it earlier. Perfect. Ephesians 1. And then I think we can uh we can go with God. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him 
who fills all in all. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for spending time with us, for never leaving us. Thank you for helping us protect the seed, guard our hearts, and to remember that we are at war in the Spirit. Thank you for new moves, for wisdom, and for being a shelter for us because your word says that you're a shelter for your beloved. Amen. Love y'all.